I don't know why these mics are usually set for adults. <laughs> well, Betty and I are honored that you invited us to worship with you and to celebrate with you and have a party with you and to eat with you. It's quite an honor for us. We passed through Fort Smith, I guess hundreds of times between Oklahoma and our home in western Tennessee during school days at Enid, Oklahoma. I never dreamed that I'd be in a building like this on an occasion like this. But to be invited into the circle of your remembering is a special privilege. I remember something about you. I remember Ray Wallace, who was a minister here, and Ken Teagard, Bill Howell, I remember, Hank Tyler, I remember. I remember Ross Bramer, who was briefly a student of mine in Emory, in Atlanta, after he finished his seminary work and was ordained here in 1977. He did work on a PhD in New Testament, and I was one of his teachers, a very bright young man. But I don't remember very much. Uh, you remember 150 years. Unbelievable. 150 years ago, on the edge of what most of this country thought was the edge of lawlessness at a fort between the United States and the Indian nation, a church. To witness to the Prince of Peace at the edge of the territory. 150 years. Franklin Pierce was president. <laughs> Nothing happened during his administration. <laughs> but he was president. Abraham Lincoln was a struggling lawyer in Springfield, Illinois. It would be 53 more years before Oklahoma, your neighbor, became a state. It would be 22 years before George Armstrong Custer lost the battle of that little big war. You were 22 years old when that happened. You were 15 years old when the first railway, the Union Pacific, crossed this continent, 1869. In 1969, Americans landed on the moon. And most of this country just kind of yawned. But in 1869, when the railroad went across this country, the last spike was driven, the first train went across, this whole country just about killed itself in celebration. And you were 15 years old. 11 years old, when the first shot of the Civil War was fired. I just can't believe how old you are. <laughs> but you might come back with a statement that there's nobody here that remembers that. Of course not. But that's not what memory is. Memory is a community activity. A community remembers not an individual, but a whole community. Take, for instance, the Israelites. When a, when a boy or a girl among the Jews enters into that ritual of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah, this is one thing they say. We were in Egypt and we were sore oppressed and we cried out to God and God heard our cry and delivered us with a 
strong hand and a mighty arm. We were in Egypt, says this 13-year-old girl who's never been out of the county. How can she say we were in Egypt? Because we were in Egypt. Because they remember as a community of Israel, not just one person who is so egocentric as to think, if it happened before I was born, I'm not interested. We were in Egypt. Once when many and I and family were in Israel, we had a guide, of course his name was Jonah, what else, showing us around, and we left Tel Aviv one morning going to Jerusalem, and he said, uh, may we go another way, I want to show you something. Sure, you're the guy, we don't know. We went a back way. He stopped this little Volkswagen. He said, now they were coming along the road here. But we knew they were coming. So we went around the backside, came over the brow of the hill, and we killed every one of those, and then he had some kind of bad language. And I said, now was that in the war of 18, I mean, uh, 1948 or 1967? And he said, that was the Maccabean War. The Maccabean War was 165 years before Christ. And he said, we knew they were coming here and we came over the hill and we, and I said, Jonah, you're older than I thought. <laughs> you talk like you were there. And he said, I was there. He didn't mean that in a spooky sense. He meant it in the same sense you remember. It's a community activity. And the history of the people is my history. I recall hearing Scott Amaday, a Kiowa Indian, who taught at that time, uh, taught literature at the University of California, and I was at a meeting when he told about his life near Fort Sill, Oklahoma, growing up. He said, I remember one morning, my father waked me early and said, let's go, son. And sleepily, I went with my father to the cabin of an elderly Kiowa woman. And my father said, I'll pick you up this evening. He left me there. All day long, that woman told me the story of the Kiowa, how we started up near the Yellowstone River, how we were a small tribe, of the hunts, the blizzards, the fights with other tribes, the coming of the white man, the moving southward through Nebraska and Kansas, Oklahoma, to the reservation. She sang the songs, she chanted the chants, she told the stories all day long. About sundown, my father came and said, son, it's time to go. I left her house, a Kiowa. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if every church in the world would have such an educational program of teaching its members, its youth, its children, the stories, the songs and the chants and the stories of God and of Christ and the church. Tell us of Nazareth and Bethlehem. Tell us of Jerusalem, of Rome and London, of Boston and Baltimore and Lexington, Tell us the stories so that when we leave the church, we leave as Christians. Because being a Christian, I want to say this now carefully, being a Christian is an act of memory. And if you cannot remember, if you cannot remember any farther back than your own birth, then you are certainly an orphan. An orphan. You don't remember. How far back can you remember? Can you remember God? That's way back there. 
Now, when I say this, I don't mean it in a spooky sense. Uh, we live in north of Georgia, in the mountains, and I was at the little hospital in our community. One morning, taking my turn as a volunteer chaplain, and uh, there was a new baby born. The babies aren't born in the hospitals in the mountains of North Georgia once in a while. Last week, one was born in the parking lot. She didn't quite make it. But most of the children in those mountains are born at home. Who needs a doctor? Old Mrs. So-and-so down the road has delivered a thousand babies. We just get her. But this baby was born in the hospital, and everybody was up against the glass looking at this little baby, obviously a girl, everything pink. She was just a little wrinkled red thing there. I stopped and looked in. I suppose every relative in the county was there. Leaning against the other wall was a young man, looked to be about 28, 30. I said, are you related to the newborn? He said, that's my daughter, my first daughter. He wasn't over there with the crowd. He was totally in charge. That's my daughter. She was wiggling and twisting, and you could tell with her mouth open, she was screaming bloody murder. I wanted to explain to him, this is his first child. There's nothing wrong with it. Doctors tell us that's the way they clean out their lungs. That's the way they get their muscles going, get their blood circulating. It's perfectly normal. There's nothing wrong with her. And he said, I know there's nothing wrong with her. Except she's mad. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean she's mad? And he said, would you be mad if one minute you're in heaven with God and the next minute you're in Georgia? <laughs> you see what he was thinking? That his little girl had been with God. This is an old, old theory. This is the way some people understand children being so natural in their talk about God and about Jesus. Jesus is coming to our house. We're going to play with Jesus. It's just so natural. A few years later, just as awkward as everything to talk about religion. But a child talks naturally about religion because they have just fresh come from God. It's an old theory. You don't have to buy it. I don't, but I like it. I don't mean that at all. To remember God is not something supernatural. It's not something that happens from before you were born. Remembering God comes through God's reminders that have been left along your way. In creation, the way God has left reminders of God's own self in the created world is just amazing. In the spring of the year, when the world is a poem of light and color, and the meadows just turn somersaults of joy, and the butterflies flutter up from the buttercups, who can say, there's no God? Who could? In the summer, when the vines are heavy with fruit and berries, and vegetables, and the women are canning it and putting it away in the freezer, and the whole world is one mark of God's providence for all of us. Who can say, there's no God? And in the autumn, when the school bell rings, and the football is kicked in the air, and the air turns a little chilly, and the leaves turn to flame, and the days get short, and you get out a sweater. Who can say, there's no God. And in the wintertime, it's bitter cold. And the naked trees, bereft of all their leaves, beg for a blanket. And down comes a blanket of snow, and the flying cloud, and the frosty night, 
and the year is dying in the night, and someone yells, Happy New Year! Who can say? Who can say? There's no God. Every square inch of the world, no matter how desolate it may appear, leaves some little reminder of God. And if you're keen in your observation, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of every acre of the world, there are the initials of the Creator, G-O-D. Can anyone say, there's no God, the reminders are sprinkled everywhere, especially in the heart. Did you ever get up in the morning before everybody else is up, fix yourself a cup of coffee, sit down on the back step, wrap your fingers around it like it were a small stove. Do that for 10 minutes without thinking God and I will say you are a very unusual person. Or late in the afternoon, just as it's getting dark, take a walk by yourself, a leisurely walk, and look up, and hope sees a star, love hears the rustle of a wing, and not think God. The writer of the Gospel of John says, in creation and in the heart, God has left the reminder. But that's not enough. You can listen to every mockingbird in Arkansas and not know enough about God. Look at every leaf in the autumn in Arkansas and not know enough about God. Listen to your own heart all you want to, not know enough about God. This is why Philip, in John 14, Philip asked Jesus, when they were all confused about what he was saying, didn't understand his teaching, I'm going away, a little while you won't see me, a little while you will see me, I will send the Holy Spirit. They couldn't handle it. And so Philip said, if you will show us God, we'll be satisfied. Because that's what we want more than anything else in the world is to know God. What is God like? And Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you all this time and you haven't got it? Whoever has seen me has seen God. What does that mean? It means if you want to understand what God is like, look at Jesus of Nazareth. There is the window through which we see God. There is the ultimate reminder, the teacher of God. God is kind, loving, touches, blesses, Heals, forgives, cares, embraces, receives. I followed Jesus around when I was a little boy through a picture book that was in the Sunday school class. Sometimes our teachers didn't show up at Central Avenue Christian Church. I don't know where they were. Good teachers when they were there, but sometimes no teacher. And there would be five or six of us Third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade is all kind of the same when you're a small church. It's all kind of the same, you know. Young adult classes are 50 and 60 year olds. You know how to do <laughs> But there was on the table a picture book, the story of Jesus. And I would turn the pages of this beautiful colored book. Every page there was a picture of Jesus holding children on his lap and a memory verse, feeding a multitude on the side of the hill and a memory verse. 
blessing a woman who was having a terrible hemorrhage and he healed her. Talking with a woman at the well, talking with his own disciples, teaching the crowds, healing a leper. Oh, it was a big book. It was a beautiful book. And just as a third or fourth or fifth grader, I don't remember, I was so impressed by that book. That's what I see when somebody mentions Jesus. And Jesus said, that's the way God is. Therefore, I reject. I reject out of hand anybody who uses the name of God to authorize cruelty, hurt, violence, killing, pain. No, 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 no. That's not God. That's not God. This is life eternal. To know God and to believe on the one that God has sent. And Jesus said to his disciples, I know your inclination is to forget all this that I'm saying to you, but when the Holy Spirit comes, one of the first jobs of the Holy Spirit is to bring to your remembrance what I have done and what I have said. Because this is the way you remember God. Of all the desires of the human heart, of all the things that I want and you want, I think, first of all, if you'll be honest, sometimes we're not honest. We come to church and somebody hands us a bulletin and says, we know, you, we know that you're here wanting to remember God. Oh no, I just had an hour to kill and thought I'd stop off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way we talk. But deep inside what we want is to know God every hour of every day. It will radically change your life. I try to think on the way over here if there's anything I want more than to remember God. And I came up with one thing. It surprised me. But I came up with one thing. I think more than remembering God, it sounds selfish, but I want God to remember me. <coughs> to remember me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom.